Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we uh, we all just read through quietly by ourselves uh, First Timothy chapter one, and I just asked you all to share um, insights that you've received. And Charles shared with us. Thank you, Charles. Elisha has posted. He says um, Paul, despite considering himself the worst of sinners or the foremost of sinful men, was judged faithful by God and entrusted with the stewardship of his word and his service. I believe that this serves as a reminder that God does not see the potential in everyone, no matter their past, and is willing to use them to advance his kingdom. And we should not write people off as sinners, but instead strive to bring them to Christ so that he can transform them and use them for his glory. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elisha. Anyone else like to share uh, insights that you received, thing that you learned while just reading through First Timothy chapter one? Anyone? You can unmute your mics and uh, please share. It'd be nice to hear. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, Pastor. Um, for me, that two things, uh, three things that I learned from, from 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 chapter one. One is when Paul said, uh, because he uh, he committed sin in ignorance, and then that reminds me of what says, I think it's either John or Peter, say that if you sin, sin uh, well knowing that you're sinning, there's no more uh, sacrifice for you. And then that reminds me of myself that I need to uh, to be mindful of that. And second thing is, um, where is it? Where is the acceptance? Okay, thank you, Pastor. I'll, I'll leave today. Okay, thank you, Rangi. Uh, Kennedy says that the urge for sound doctrines only. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yes, I just wanted to um, uh, just try to understand a little bit more about um, that um, that verse man, number uh, nineteen, or uh, sorry twenty, where he mentions about these two people, uh, Hymenius and Alexander, uh, where Paul says, uh, "Who am I? Who I deliver? Whom I deliver to Satan? That we learn not to blaspheme." So. I just wanted to understand um, the you know for someone to for for those two people to to blaspheme was that um, you know such a such a big sin that um, Paul you know had to deliver to Satan and um, what did what did it mean did it, did it mean that you know both these people were then just not um, uh, able to be forgiven by god or uh, you know what what was this what uh, why uh, if, what's this thing that great so i just wanted to understand more about that yeah uh we'll actually look at it when we come to verse 20 but since you've uh, already asked me you know uh hymenus is also we see is mentioned in second timothy chapter 2 verse 17 um and uh, here he's mentioned with uh, you know he's uh, mentioned with alexander uh there in okay, sorry second timothy chapter 2 was 17 is mentioned in connection with philetus as a very dangerous man um so one of the um, uh, doctrines which hymenius was promoting in the church was that the resurrection was already passed. We we look at it again when we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18. Um, so that is all we know about Hymenius. But when it comes to Alexander, you know, um, in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4, verse 14, we see that Alexander is a coppersmith and uh, he's mentioned as someone who did much evil uh to paul and it's possible that it's just the same alexander you know that who was instrumental in handing over paul uh you know to uh, to the authorities so paul says that he hands them you know um 
over to you know to satan and we see, we also look at this uh, something that paul uh, does similar to this uh, he writes about this something similar in first corinthians chapter 5 verse 5 you know uh, and he says where you know uh, these men have to be excommunicated you put out the fellowship of the church um, because uh, when they are uh, you know when paul is saying excommunicate them or put them out of church uh, it's not that you know he's thinking bad for them or uh, that he does not want them to uh, to come to a real realization of the truth or to be saved or uh, you know the, their souls to be lost in eternity or to be done away with such people uh, or with such men but uh, you know uh, what he's basically meaning here and in when he's saying in first corinthians chapter 5 verse 5 he's saying you know uh, excommunicate these people send them out of the church uh, and here he's saying you know i'll hand over both of these men to satan uh, it's not uh, we, we we don't look at it in you know how can Paul be so evil or mean or rude, uh, but his intent was something that was good. Uh, so when he's saying you know give them up to Satan or excommunicate them, he's saying that these people when uh, when they are under Satan or when they're out of the church, they're out of that spiritual covering. Okay, they're no longer under spiritual oversight and the church leadership they're no longer under the spiritual covering of uh, god and uh, if you remember you learned this in uh, in um, uh, healing and deliverance you know when when uh, god removes his hand of protection over us then we are um, you know we are uh, uh, open to the elements of this world where sickness or disease or you know uh, infirmities uh, or even for satan to attack us so we have we don't have that spiritual covering and satan is you know uh, his work is uh, you know he's a liar he's the father of all lies and uh, he's all out to steal kill and destroy so that is what he will do with our lives and so when these people when they are going through this uh, you know when they're facing sickness or disease or infirmities or you know constant uh, uh, turmoil and tribulation and difficulties then you know they will come to a realization of the sin that they have committed you know it it it's automatic when we when we go through trials difficulties sin we automatically say what did i do wrong god but please forgive all my sins please you know heal me um, uh, restore me you know wherever i've fallen uh, so it's uh, uh, they'll come to a point where they realize the the evil deeds their wicked ways uh, how they've gone away from god and that will you know uh, uh, draw them back to god uh, in their in their their, uh, distress in their difficulties in their pain in their brokenness they will come to a realization that you know, no one can rescue them other than god and they will it will lead them ultimately to turn into god so um though the language is very uh, sounds very rude and harsh and uh, strong here but paul has a, a a good intention behind so that you know when these people are faced with the, uh, these uh, kind of troubles and difficulties they're open to the attacks of the evil one or the elements of this world uh, they you know they will come to a realization of the truth they will turn back to god they will repent and their souls will be saved for eternity did that help christopher ah uh, yes thank you i i just just a follow-on question because uh sometimes um you know uh, we as um, christians also uh you know are uh, sometimes uh, you know, judge people and um, you know we also uh, in some ways uh, also feel that you know if there are there are people who are really evil um uh do do should be we kind of you know you know sort of uh, do something similar to what paul has done or me i mean it could be you know, some some of us or it could be even you know maybe people who are you know uh, you know, pastors or whatever. Is that is that something that um, should be done, or we should not do it? I think what we could do is, uh, you know, we have the whole, uh, you know, we can ask the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. We can pray for them. Uh, uh, 
you know, and uh, ask God to, you know, uh, cause them to uh, come to a realization of the truth, to see, uh, you know, uh, the truth, uh, to live the truth, to walk in that truth, and to, you know, turn from their wicked ways. So, God, do something, orchestrate their ways in, uh, you know, their lives in such a way that they will come to the realization of the truth, they will repent, and I think that is a good prayer to pray. <laughs> Yeah, is that okay? And just pray for them. Yeah, okay. Yes, Mangi, you had your hand up, and then we we'll ask Divya. She also has a hand up. Yes, Mangi. Thank you, Pastor. Um, yeah, some uh, just just to follow up from a previous question. Uh, so, what's the relationship? Is can we uh, get in this verse and the one in, in uh, Matthew eighteen seventeen when Jesus said. If your brother is not does not uh, listen, throw it, treat him as an unbeliever or a tax collector. So what's a, what's the relationship between these two verses, and how do we treat a, a, a sinner, and how do we send someone to set them? Thank you, Pastor. So, um, how do we treat a sinner? Uh, uh, thank you, Mangi, for your question. How do we treat a sinner? A sinner here, actually, these two people with who Paul is referring to, Hymenius and Alexander, they're actually part of the church. So they have heard the truth, they know the doctrines, uh, and they have turned away. So Paul mentions some of them in his uh, letters. We saw even in Romans, he mentions people who have gone away from the faith, who have departed. Uh, you know, who deserted him, uh, deserted the faith and things like that. So they, these people know the truth and they have gone away. So that is why Paul is using this, uh, this uh, so-called harsh or hard language uh, for them to come to a realization of the truth and nothing but difficulties and the son is going to you know bring them back the truth. But for sinners, basically, when we're talking about sinners, we're um, I am assuming that they have, they they are not believers. They have not known the truth. They have not heard the truth. So for them, we basically pray and uh, share and um, uh, you know speak and um, minister to them from our own lives, from our own testimony, the way that we live. Uh, just portray Christ, just reveal Christ, uh, and reveal the truth to them so that they come to a realization of the truth because they're not able to see the truth because you know they've uh, uh, Satan has blinded their eyes from seeing the truth. But for those who have known the truth and gone away from the truth, you can't speak the truth back to them because basically, you know, Paul is saying you can't speak the truth because they already know the truth and they deviated from the truth and they are going to. You know, they have uh, answers to give you back. Uh, so, you know, it's only when they face hardships that they're going to turn around. But for those who are sinners, they do not know the truth because Satan has blinded them. But we pray and we minister, we share the truth with them, uh, the love of God with them, so that they, uh, you know, they repent and they uh, come back to God. Did that help, Mangi? Yes, Pastor. Did yes. I address Thank the you question? So Yes, okay. yes thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, Divya? Yeah, thank you, Pastor. I just wanted to uh, highlight some of the points that uh, popped out for me as I was reading mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. chapter one. So I really love the way uh, Paul uh, describes God there, uh, especially saying that uh, God our Savior, uh, Lord Jesus Christ our hope, um also in verse 17 um paul writes he's the king eternal immortal invisible uh to god who alone is wise uh be honor and glory forever and ever um also the way uh paul is uh, you know addressing himself uh, as an apostle of jesus christ uh by the commandment of god our savior and the lord jesus christ our hope um, and also how he addresses Timothy as a true son in the faith. Uh, 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 so, uh, yeah, and uh, there are some words that are really repeating over and over in the first chapter, like good conscience, sincere faith, pure heart, 
so these are I feel like Paul is um, uh, these are some things that that matter um, and uh, also uh, even as everyone was sharing like how Paul is uh, talking about God's mercy and grace in his life um, in verses 12 to 17 and also verse 18 where Timothy is given the charge to um, wage the good warfare um, uh, uh, and uh, to commit committing to you according to the prophecies previously made concerning you that by them you may wage the good warfare having faith and good conscience uh, so in our lives as well uh, especially as the word of the lord for 2023 like uh, pray uh, like your blessing is coming pray through till breakthrough so yeah there are promises <laughs> of god uh, and there are prophecies made concerning each one uh, and need to hold on to it yeah whatever may be our circumstances whatever uh, people might tell uh, or may may tarry we might have to uh, you know just hold on to those prophecies and promises of god yeah yeah that's it thank you thank you divya thank you so much it's good insights uh asha is saying first timothy chapter 1 verse 16 but god had mercy on me so that christ jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience even the worst sinners then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life i love this passage this verse it was beautiful and it's touched me and helped me to realize the importance thank you um uh, stavani has uh, asked to shed light on verse 18 so um verse 18 we'll come to it but then maybe because you've asked uh, i can just quickly uh, share uh, verse 18 paul says this i charge i commit to you son timothy according to the prophecies previously made concerning you that by them you may um, wage the good warfare so ba basically prophecies he's talking about what was spoken over um, uh, you know uh, timothy's life uh, so you know i'm sure they would have had ministry time people would have spoken over uh, timothy paul would have spoken received uh, uh, words uh, of prophecy and that which he has spoken over uh, timothy's life or other people would have spoken over uh, um, uh, Timothy's life. So he's basically using this, uh, you know, uh, this this chapter to encourage young Timothy. We look at why he's he's writing all of these things. So he's encouraging him, and um, he's saying that you know, hey, uh, you know, prophecies were spoken over your life. He also mentions about this in First Timothy chapter four, verse. Um, uh, verse 14 where he says do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the leadership so you know um, uh, the anointing the uh, the gifts that he had received uh, when uh, which had imparted to him when people laid hands the elders laid hands so he's saying don't neglect that gift he's just encouraging him that you have these gifts of leadership you know uh, and god is uh, taking you at this point to this church things might be very difficult but remember what was spoken over your life uh, so god has pre-planned this foreordained this uh, has spoken over your life and you know hold on to those prophecies also i think it's in second timothy chapter 1 uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse uh, 6, he says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying and on of hands. Uh, so, you know, he's saying, hey, you know, you've received, you've been in, uh, given all of these gifts, these capabilities which are spoken over you, prophesied over you, you know, and these are good enough uh, uh, and this, uh, you know, uh, that will sustain you, that will help you to continue to run your race and to accomplish what God has called you to do here in the Church of Ephesus. Did that help, uh, Avini? Stavini? Okay. Okay, so um, thank you all for sharing. We'll um, look at uh, study First Timothy chapter um, 
1, okay, um, verse 1, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Okay, so Paul begins his write letters, uh, you know, by writing his own name first, uh, which is like a letter writing custom in his days. So first the letter or the writer of the letter is mentioned and then the reader. So we look at verse 2, he says to Timothy. So first the writer of the letter is mentioned, which is the custom of Paul's day. And then, you know, the uh, the reader or the person he's writing to. And then, you know, uh, Paul, uh, the person gives greetings to. So that is why uh, Paul is writing his name there. And he, he says, Paul, an apostle. Uh, so we know an apostle comes from the Greek word apostolos, uh, and, and an apostle is somebody who is uh, sent with orders. Uh, he's a delegate, an ambassador, uh, somebody who is commissioned, so a commissioned one, uh, a messenger, um, and, uh, you know, somebody who's called into the office of an uh, apostle. So an apostle is basically a sent one, somebody sent out with a special uh, mission, uh, a messenger, a delegate. And in terms of function, he's one who goes ahead and pioneers things, starts uh, things uh, where no one else has gone, uh, what uh, no one else has uh, done. And Paul is saying, you know, he's, he's uh, making very clear to the church at Ephesus, you know, because he's going to write very uh, important things, matters, administration of the church, which... Uh, uh, it, this is this letter is those written to Timothy is going to be read out to all the churches at Ephesus. So you know um, Paul is making known um, who he is, what is his calling. That as an apostle, you know, uh, appointed by Jesus Christ Himself, by um, by God Himself, He has the authority to write what He is writing. He has the authority to tell the church what they have to do, what they shouldn't be doing um, about church administration, uh, church order, uh, and how to bring about things in the church. So He's He's basically setting the stage. You know, He's making things very clear uh, because people can turn around and ask Timothy, "Okay, who are you to tell us?" these things, who is Paul to write. Uh, so he's saying that he's an apostle and he's mentioning that he's an apostle of uh, Jesus Christ. So which means he's saying that uh, he's been called to this responsibility. He's been equipped. He has been sent forth um, uh, as God's authoritative messenger so uh, his authority comes from god he derives his authority from god he's been equipped by him he's been sent forth by him so as an apostle paul had god's authority and uh, god is the one who gave paul this particular call and function uh, which was that of an apostle so here we know that you know or we uh, we can see that you know god has gifted each one of us different gifts uh, and uh, you know whether it's an apostle a prophet a teacher an administrator a helper uh, somebody like stephen who is uh, just serving uh, waiting upon people but we know sir stephen was full of wisdom uh, uh, of um, full of the spirit full of the fear of the lord even though he was just somebody who was waiting on people just serving but each one of us you know god has given us different gifts and each of these different gifts, you know, we can't, um, uh, you know, we can't compare it with each other because each of these gifts are uh, important for the mutual edification of the body of Christ and for the glory of God. So we can't say that, hey, you know, I'm just an helper in church. I'm not an apostle. I'm not a prophet or I'm not a pastor or a teacher so my role is not very important uh, it's not true we can't compare um, 
you know, one's role against the other because, you know, each one of us have received different gifts from God. It's God who gives us the gifts and he's given us all different gifts. And each of our gifts are important, are precious, are valuable for the edification of the body of Christ. So don't look at your gift as something that uh, you use to compare or look down on yourself or undermine your uh, roles and responsibilities, your commitment in the body of Christ but you need to look at your gift as something that Christ has given you that God has given you and look at it as something which is important for the mutual edification of the church so your gift is important for the edifying of the body of Christ for the work of God to be established and continued in the in the body of Christ and for the glory of God so you're going you're doing using your gift to manifest his glory which means to manifest his glory means um you know, to reveal who God is, to make known his nature and what he does. Okay, so whether we see that even Stephen, even though he was just uh, serving people, waiting on people, serving uh, uh, tables, you know, serving food, but he was full of uh, wisdom and knowledge and full of the spirit and the fear of the Lord. And he was also doing mighty signs, miracles and uh, wonders. So, you know, it's not just those in like pastors and, and apostles who have to do all of this but it's also us who can flow in the supernatural who can manifest the glory of god of who he is and what he does even through you know um uh, you know if you're just a helper or an administrator whatever we are just use our gifts to the glory of god so we need to recognize discern our gifts uh, and the place of ministry to which God has called us to, and we need to use our gifts um, and not compare or, uh, you know, look down or undermine, but stay committed, faithful, and use it for the glory of um, God. So whatever is our gifts or the offices that God has called us to, you know, we must completely surrender, uh, surrender ourselves, surrender our will, and, uh, you know, surrender ourselves and uh, use it for the glory of God. And uh, Paul says that, you know, uh, he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the commandment of God. So he's basically you know, stressing things, laying out things very clear, making things very clear uh, to the church at Ephesus. He's saying here, I am an apostle, not because I'm calling myself as an apostle, but because of the commandment of God. So, you know, his calling is a command of God. So our calling, each one of us, our calling, whatever is our calling, you know, you know, it's not something that, um, uh, you know, it's not something that people give us, but it's a command from God. And, uh, you know, even as it's a command from God, we need to be faithful to what God has called us to and what God has entrusted us to. And then uh, he goes on to say, you know, uh, uh, commandment of God, uh, our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ are um, hope. Okay, and in verse, uh, sorry. Okay, so he here Paul mentions uh, in this phrase, you know, uh, God our uh, Savior and the Lord Jesus, uh, sorry, commandment of God, our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he, our hope, he's talking about uh, two persons of the Godhead. Uh, so we believe in God the Father, we believe in God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, in verse 1 and verse 2, we see Paul is mentioning about, uh, you know, uh, the Godhead, God the Father, God the uh, Son. So God our Savior, uh, God is our Father, and Jesus Christ, who was our hope, our um, Lord. So it's good to recognize you know, just like uh, Divya pointed, it's good to recognize, you know, all who God is and all that he means to us. So here, even as Paul is writing about the Godhead, he's basically recognizing who God is and all uh, that God means to us. So God is our savior, he's our father, he's our hope, he's our Lord, uh, he's our healer, he's our deliverer, he's our provider, a redeemer, and we can go on with all of the nature and the attributes and the characteristics of God. So it's good to acknowledge, to recognize uh, who God is. And then Paul goes on to write in verse 2 to Timothy, 
a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So, uh, as uh, we as, as mentioned earlier, you know, Paul taught and mentored Timothy uh, and helped him grow uh, spiritually and helped him to grow in his service uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so we also see that, you know, Paul refers to Timothy as his son. So they had a father-son uh, relationship. So here he says, you know, to Timothy, a true son in their faith. So Paul is saying that Timothy have a father and son relationship because of their common faith. So what is their common faith? Their common faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So by using this, uh, this word or this term common, you know, the Apostle Paul is reminding us of that which uh, we hold common with all believers and what do we hold common with all believers uh, we hold common is our personal faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior and this personal faith that you know each one of us hold uh, as Jesus as our Lord and Savior is one that binds us together you know as a spiritual family um, regardless of our nationality our status uh, you know um, uh, the places that we come from whatever you know all of those are important to us yes but what really binds us together holds us is our personal faith our personal faith our belief in, in the lord jesus christ as our lord and uh, savior so all of us you know who have believed in jesus as our lord and savior trusted in him uh, we stand uh, together as one as brothers and sisters in christ and uh, in some cases you know uh, we are spiritual uh, fathers spiritual mothers uh, uh, to the children that we are you know we are raising up mentoring in the body of christ and so it's this common faith uh, in jesus christ that provides us uh, the basis for our fellowship our communion our relationship and our harmony with one and other okay um, some of these, uh, you know, in, uh, extra points that I'm giving is not there in your notes. So if you're following your notes and it's not there, you want to uh, make a note of it, you can uh, go ahead and make a note of it. And then Paul, uh, you know, in his um, in his greetings, uh, he usually mentions a grace and peace. Uh, from God our Father and uh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, but here he also mentions the word mercy. Usually in most of his epistles and most of his letters, Paul mentions grace and peace. But here, uh, you know, he's also mentioning um, the word um, mercy. So when Paul is using these words, uh, you know, grace, mercy, peace in his greetings, uh, in most of his epistles, he's not just using it as a formality. Um, uh, you know, just when we write, you know, uh, we also use greetings. Sometimes it can just be used as a formality or a fill-in uh, or a way of starting the letter very well. But, you know, Paul does not use it as a formality because um, Paul knew that the source of all grace, mercy, and peace is no none can come from none other than only God, or uh, from you know God the Father, God the Son, uh, who is our uh, 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 Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. So, by writing this or mentioning you know God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not just like a formality that he is using, but he is stressing that you know this is where we get our grace our mercy and peace it comes from uh, no one else from nothing else none of the things of this world uh, can give us grace mercy and peace but it's only it only comes from god the father and the lord jesus uh, uh, christ okay um so paul is teaching us here or he's teaching the church uh, that there can be neither grace nor peace you know, until you have a personal relationship with God the Father. So what is essential uh, to a relationship with God uh, as, you know, our Heavenly Father is a relationship with Jesus Christ uh, as our Savior is, you know, uh, is, is, is the outcome of our relationship is, you know, um, grace, mercy, and peace. So he's saying what is essential 
is our relationship. What matters is our relationship uh, with God, who is our Heavenly Father. And what is also essential is our relationship with Jesus Christ because he is our Savior. So look at that uh, pronoun that Paul uses, you know, Jesus Christ, our Savior. So he stresses uh, the need for a personal faith and points uh, to a common relationship that all believers have together. So he's basically, you know, at the very start of his letter, he's making some very important phrases and, and statements. He's saying, hey, they may, uh, there is a lack of peace uh, in, your, in the church at Ephesus. There is division and all of that. Um, you know, it does not come uh, by just following some doctrines, some rituals, keeping the Old Testament laws and rituals that you're bringing in into the church, uh, some legalistic rules uh, that you want people to follow. You know, all of this is not going to bring peace because, you know, I mean, indirectly, you're just saying, hey, look, there is no peace in the church. There is division. There is strife, which he talks about in um you know, in 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 the in the next few verses, uh, sorry, I, he's uh, he mentions that in um, I think in verse um, yeah in verse um, uh, four. You know, he says there is strife. There is three and four. He mentions about it. You know, uh, he's saying there is no peace uh, in the church because. Uh, you know, and he says, where does peace come from is, you know, not just in a corporate gathering where you're bringing about all of these legalistic rules and rituals and uh, your own so-called uh, doctrines, but it's, uh, it's in your personal relationship with God the Father and God the Son. And that translates into unity and oneness in the body of Christ. So, you know, uh, some of us can, you know, when we are not at peace, with God, when we are not in um, a right relationship with God, you know, it can, uh, you know, Satan can use us to bring about disunity and strife in the body of Christ. So we need to check ourselves. You know, we can't say that in this church there is no unity and uh, and there's no peace or there's no love. It, it has to start from us. If each one of us are in love with God the Father, God the Son, we are at peace with them, it automatically translates into having love and peace with uh, uh, with believers with whom we share um, a common bond of relationship because of our personal faith in uh, Christ Jesus our Lord. So it all begins with our, you know, our personal relationship with um, God the Father and God the uh, Son. Okay, so here he stresses on that R, you know, the pronoun R, and the, the need of personal faith, and points to uh, that translates into a common relationship of all, that all believers have together, that he is our savior. Now, uh, this phrase, our savior, um, or the title savior was, you know, uh, in Paul's time was used uh, to honor the Roman emperor. Okay, so, so some commentators, some writers mention this. They they say that this word savior uh, was a word that was, or a term that was, or a title that was used to honor the Roman emperor. And so people called and were forced to call uh, Caesar or Nero as savior. And so Paul, you know, uh, in this context that he's writing, you know, made the identity of the real savior very, very clear. And he went by, by saying that, you know, uh, he's God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So very clearly he's mentioning that God, that, you know, savior is not like, uh, you know, like Nero and, uh, and Caesar were persecuting the Christians who were... Um, fallen human beings, uh, evil in their own ways, uh, but he's making uh, the identity of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, or the real identity of the Savior known, and that can be seen in the person of, uh, uh, the Lord, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is uh, God himself. Any questions so far in verses 1 and 2? Any questions? 
Okay, if there's no questions, we'll move on to verse uh, 3 and 4. Can somebody qu uh, quickly read 3 and 4, please, loudly? Anyone? Okay, son. As I yes, argue, go ahead. When I went, okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. As I, I, I argued you when I moved into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they may they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to the feeble and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Mangi. So uh, Paul is, you know, uh, uh, telling um, uh, Timothy remain in Ephesus, which means he would have heard, you know, Paul has left Timothy in uh, in Ephesus. He's gone on to, um, uh, you know, he's gone on to Macedonia. He's writing to him, uh, and you know, he's saying that, you know you remain here in Ephesus. Maybe, you know, there might be different reasons uh, why Timothy might not want to remain in Ephesus. He might have missed Paul. Uh, he wanted to be with his mentor. Uh, he might, uh, you know, have been intimidated by uh, following uh, Paul's ministry, you know, um, or he might feel he is very timid or, uh, you know, reserved in nature and, you know, Perhaps he would have just feel uh, intimidated by the challenges that he's facing. Um, he might have been discouraged by uh, the difficulties of the ministry, the people that he has to relate to. Um, he might have had questions of his own calling. Is this what God wants me to uh, do? Is this the right place? Uh, you know, am I in the right place, the right calling? Uh, also, maybe, you know, frustrated disappointed at uh, you know all the false teachings that were there um, uh, and the behavior of the people the christians the uh, the rules the legalism that they were all bringing in the division in the church uh, but you know despite all of these reasons um uh, that you know it's there was no doubt in apostle paul's mind uh, that god wanted timothy to remain in ephesus and i'm sure you know paul before he would have placed timothy there he would have done it by the leading of the spirit he would have prayed about it and so he says you know remain in ephesus maybe paul wants uh, timothy wants to come back to paul so he would have heard about it so he's you know writing there remain in Ephesus and um, you know Paul gives him six reasons uh, in chapter one uh, why he should stay there and finish the ministry that God has given him to do so first Timothy chapter one verses three to seven uh, he says because people need the truth people need to know the truth and uh, in the same chapter in verses eight to eleven he says because you minister in a hard place so Paul is saying yes I know you're in a hard place but you know you need to remain there 12 to 16 he says you know God uses unworthy people so maybe Paul is sorry Timothy is feeling he's unworthy uh, you know timid um, uh, unworthy in the sense that you know there are elders there there are grown-up people who are leaders of the church and feels unworthy to even tell them what to do not to do uh, you know what is the order that he has to bring in church administration that he has to set right um, so Paul is saying you know God uses unworthy people as well if you're feeling unworthy you're in that situation you know God will use you there in verse 17 you know because um paul is reminding uh, timothy that you serve a great god you know a great god who can do great things accomplish great things uh, more than he can even think ask or imagine uh, verse 18 he says uh, because you are in a battle and you cannot surrender very easily you know uh, a soldier is reminding him of a soldier who goes to the battlefield you know if a, uh, he doesn't turn around and run away you know it's considered to be a coward uh, soldier uh, but he will fight till the very end just till he you know lays down his life or he's dead so he says you cannot surrender uh, that's not what a soldier is called to or you know that's not uh, uh, who he is uh, and then in verse 19 to 20 he says because not everyone else does so you know um, yes you know 
Paul is saying, I, I, I know what you're going through, but you can't uh, uh, leave that place. You have to remain there. Uh, so it just reminds us that, you know, sometimes God will allow us uh, to be in difficult situations, put us in diffi difficult places of ministry. Uh, things will not be easy. We just feel like uh, leaving the mission field, the place that God has called us to, um, and run away. But nothing is going to come very easy, you know. Uh, nothing is going to be easy. Wherever we are going to minister, serve, work, you know, uh, nothing is going to be easy. Uh, we're going to have every attack of the evil one, uh, people who are as in hindrance. Um, but we need to set our minds. Um, you know, on what God has uh, called us to, you know, like Paul says, you know, I take hold of that which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me and I continue to run my um, uh, race, you know, uh, and he's saying this, he's saying, you know, forgetting everything that is behind. Yes, things have happened in the past. We have done things that are not uh, appropriate, right? We have messed up things but he says you know whatever is the situation he says you know um, I'm pressing on you know I'm taking hold of that which Christ Jesus has taken uh, hold of um, me um, just read this so I just thought I'll share it with you all you know, many years ago uh, a famous Arctic uh, explorer you know he put this ad in a London newspaper uh, and it reads as this men wanted for hazardous journey small wages bitter cold long months of complete darkness constant danger safe return doubtful honor and recognition in case of success so this is the uh, uh, ad that this arctic explorer uh, put up in the london newspaper he did not make things very easy glossy comfortable nice but he just um, mentioned uh, the hard things and the small wages uh, and the hazardous journey uh, but you know uh, surprisingly thousands of men responded to the appeal uh, and the reason why thousands of men uh, responded to this ad was because they were willing to embrace a difficult job um, uh, with small wages, difficult journey, um, uh, doubtful of returning because um, you know they had a great leader. Now, when I read this uh, it, it was it just struck me because you know, uh, when uh, we step into ministry, things are not going to be easy. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, you know, uh, we will not even receive honor and recognition and all of those things. Uh, we might not see success at the level that we expected, anticipated, that we wanted. Uh, and it can be very difficult. Um, situations can be very difficult, but always your focus should not be on your problem, but it should be on, you know, the one who has called you, uh, you know. So that is why Paul says, you know, fixing my eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter, and the finisher of my race, I continue to run my race with endurance and perseverance. So Paul had it right, you know. Um, his eyes were always fixed on uh, the one who had called him, uh, you know, the one who had entrusted things to him. And that is why, you know, in spite of all the difficulties, in spite of all the persecutions and the shipwrecks and the beatings and, you know, thing, times when he was left dead, you know, he just gets on his feet and he, you know, marches on. He continues on in ministry because his eyes were focused on the leader, the one who called him because he knew he was greater um, and um, sufficient enough, his grace was sufficient enough and was capable enough uh, to help him to run his race. So even as we are, uh, you know, journeying on uh, in the beginning of this year, just like to leave us uh, with this, you know, uh, things might 
be easy for us. Things might be comfortable this year. Things might be exciting. There might be challenges. There might be difficulties. But don't focus your uh, your uh, or gaze or uh, you know look at your problems. But you know focus on the one who has called you, because greater is He who is in us, uh, who is in us, than He is in the world. You know, and He can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine. And He's the one who opposes us with his righteous right hand and he will continue to lead us and guide us and give us the strength the skills the capabilities uh, empower us the holy spirit empowers us his presence is there and he will lead us on and uh, and you know uh, the one who has called us is faithful um, and he will do everything that concerns us that is required of us okay so stop here anyone has any questions anything you'd like to share No the question. I just wanted no to questions. find out with regards to the uh, Bible reference for this. Uh, you mentioned those six reasons why uh, Paul uh, felt uh, uh, was telling uh, Timothy to remain in uh, Ephesus. Mm -hmm. Which is the what is the Bible reference for that? Do uh, you want me to post all of that on the uh, thing? I'll do that. Uh, oh, he said, First Timothy chapter one. Okay, uh, he says he says because people need the truth. Uh, it's verses 3 and 7, 3 to 7. Uh, because you minister in a hard place, eight, verses 8 to 11. Uh, God uses unworthy people, verses 12 to 16. Uh, because he serves a great God, verse 17. Uh, because you're in a battle and you cannot surrender, verse 18. And not everyone else does, 19 to 20. So that is first first Timothy 19 to 20. Yes. Yes, first all of them in First Timothy chapter one. So all of these reasons which he's giving is in First Timothy, which I mentioned is in First Timothy chapter one. I just mentioned the verses. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Christopher. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, if not, then we'll end class. Thank no you for question, but, uh, Thank you for everything uh, we have understood. And uh, I think really it will be amazing class. Thank you, first. Thank you, Hope. <laughs> thank you for that uh, uh, for that encouragement. Thank you for enduring with me with the, the last three hours. Uh, and be patient. Thank you very much. Um, have a good um, day. Um, just to remind you all that we will not have classes from Monday, to, sorry, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. That is Wednesday to Friday. Uh, we have our Christian Leaders Conference, and um, the, uh, you know um, uh, the sessions uh, will be made available so you all 